here at USP. Uh, we hold this seminar every week, along with my colleagues Jennifer Dill, Miguel Figliozzi, um, Chris Monsier. Um, this week, our, our speaker is Smith Sirumascu. Close, Close enough. Okay. Um, he's going to talk about the next generation of adaptive signal systems. Um, uh, be two things. One, um, Smith says it's okay for you guys to ask questions at appropriate points within within the seminar, so we don't necessarily have to hold them all to the end. Um, when you do ask questions, I incur I would like for you to use the microphones on the desks in front of you. Uh, press down the button, and if the red light does not go on and it does not work, then we'll come around with the handheld mic. Um, I think that's about it, except that why don't we go around the room really quickly and each person indicate, say your name and what you're representing. So I'm representing School of Urban Studies and Planning. Start with you. My name is Moin Sheikh. I'm a master's student here in transportation engineering. Okay. Uh, Lisa Nelson, I work for Talbot Paradigm. Edward Anderson, engineer for ODOT. Oh, well that's okay, this part doesn't have to be on the mic. Uh, Chris Myers, undergraduate student in uh, development. Lindsay Walker, second year grad in MERP. Justin Carinci, I'm a transportation reporter with the Daily Journal of Commerce. Uh, Ashley here, traffic engineering. Ed Fisher, traffic engineering with uh, Oregon DOT. Chip Rice, I'm a Great, thank you. Okay, and I, I'm going to start the sign-in sheet around for the students who are in the class. Just please put an X by your name for today, and then get it back to me. I'll be over here. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to our guest speaker. Thank you, Smith. Hi there. Uh, I'm Smith Sir Moskal. I recognize some of you people. How many people actually have seen me speak here? Done this three times? Okay, just one. Maybe I was mistaken. Anyway, um, like I said, my name is Mr. Moscow. I'm with HDR Engineering. I'm a senior traffic engineer with them and a professional associate. This particular topic that I'm going to be talking on today is, um, a little, uh, is, uh, is an adaptive signal system that we've been working with for about uh, three to four years now that was developed by Rhythm Engineering. How many people in the room are, are at least uh, vaguely knowledgeable of adaptive signal systems? Have heard of them, know what they do vaguely? Okay, good. Well, for those of you who don't, I'm going to provide a brief overview of that as well. But unlike previous presentations I've done on this particular topic, I'm also going to highlight why exactly this is different and how it can change the way we do business, the way traffic engineers actually perform analysis, and its implications on the bigger picture, which is something that I generally don't touch on with this presentation. Now, typical timing, as you know, is done with t uh, basically time of day timing plans. When we have lack of any better data, we, what we do in the traffic engineering realm right now is we go out and we get the AM data, we get the PM data. We have a separate set of timing plans that we put together for the morning rush hour, the afternoon rush hour, sometimes the midday off-peak, sometimes the middle of the night. But everything is set on time of day timing plans. And those are all based on what we estimate to be our peak hour. And that is kind of averaged over the entire year because it has to be. Most places do not have time of day timing plans for multiple seasons within a year. Although in some cases the argument um, would beg otherwise that you probably should. Places that have high tourism, for example. Now, the plans are based on historical averages. And one thing that you can do once, uh, once you get your timing plan set is coordinate those signals. 
coordinate them and optimize them. And by coordinating the signals, you're looking at cycles, splits, and offsets. Is everybody here familiar with that concept? Yes? Pretty good? Cool. Now, data collection, when it actually comes to how it's used in the field, ideally you want to collect data every one, two years, and actually re-optimize your timing plans. In some cases where timings do not change all that much, where you don't have that much growth in an area, or simply where an agency doesn't have the funding. Sometimes it slips to four or five years. But by simply optimizing your timing plan, you're often looking at a decrease in delay of 20%-ish. And again, that's without doing any additional roadway work. That's without putting out additional uh, lanes, additional turn bays, additional through lanes, et cetera, et cetera. Now, adaptive signal systems, once those are put in, what an adaptive signal system tries to do, and they try to do it in different ways, is they will actually try to adjust those timing plans based on how traffic is operating that day usually within the half hour, usually within 15 minutes, but there is a little bit of a lag time with traditional t adaptive signal systems such as SCATs, such as SCOOT, etc., etc. Now, once adaptive signal systems are in place, typically the field deployments have seen reductions in delay of between 5 and 30 percent. The average seems to be more around the 12 to 15 percent, but there is an improvement, and again, this is the kind of thing where you're trying to do as much as you can, squeeze as much capacity as you can get out of your existing roadway network without having to build anything. And especially now when funding is, be, uh, funding is becoming scarce, it's much more important to try to get the most out of what you already have in the ground without actually trying to build anything. And a lot of places that you're going to look at once you get out into the public or private sector, once you get out of school, a lot of these places do not have right-of-way. There's a lot of development on all the quadrants. It's difficult to put in a lane. It's difficult to put in a turn lane. There are going to be people who are going to gripe about access, about shaving off pieces of the sidewalk so you can get that additional pavement. So that's not always available. Now, when you get into uh, the consulting field or into the, the public sector, this is something that I tell my, the, the guys that work for me, I tell, them, I tell them this all the time. If you have to do something once, understand exactly why you're doing it and each step of the way, how you're doing it. If you have to do something twice, you better be looking at a way to actually find an automated process. And one of the guys that works for me so hates the version, the, the shift from synchro to VSIM or building a base synchro network. On his own time, he went and coded a ma um, basically a little uh, macro that will allow him to import a synchro file, create a synchro file from scratch on a GIS database because he got bored. But anyway, if you find a way, if you have to do something over and over and over and over, it's something you're going to want to find a way to automate. And the big picture of the traffic, and of traffic analysis and traffic timing is you do do that thing over and over and over, but you're just doing it over years. So it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. People generally don't think about that. Now, in terms of the first generation adaptive signal systems, here are the ones that have been developed in the United States. And of these, probably the one that is most well-known in the U.S. is ACS Lite. That one was actually developed in the Los Angeles area. In terms of the other systems that are out there, there are basically two big systems that, uh, that are most well-known within the U.S. that were developed outside, and that is SCOOT and SCATS. There are a couple of other SCATS deployments that are actually in process right now in the Portland metropolitan area, one of which is on Tualatin Sherwood Road. Does anybody, is anybody familiar with the uh, Tualatin area at all? To Alton Sherwood Road, you're going to see a SCAT system go in from just east of I-5 to, I think, Teton Avenue. Now, adaptive signal systems, like we mentioned earlier, they generally yield about a 5 to 30 percent reduction in travel time in terms of delay over a, a, an optimized coordinated signal system. So if it is that good, where are they? Why aren't they more widely deployed? Well, in terms of where are they, this is a little bit out of date now, but this is probably about a year old. Here are the different locations where ones have been deployed. You'll notice that there is one listed in Vancouver, Washington. That one did go away, and it went away from a public perception standpoint. It didn't function very well. They had a lot of problems. And now, if they are that efficient, why is that map not covered in dots? If you can really make more out of your existing traffic system, just by putting in an adaptive system, why aren't they more widespread? Well, um, uh, Muhammad uh, uh, Mahdi put out, Hadi, sorry, Dr. Hadi put out a, um, 
a survey that went out, I believe, in 2004. And he surveyed all the different agencies, a lot of public agencies, to see why they did not <laughs> deploy adaptive signal systems. And one of the key responses he got back was, number one, it's too complicated. Or, keep in mind, this is, public, this is the perception of the agencies. Number two, it's very detector and data intensive. And that much is very much true for a lot of adaptive signal systems. Number three, detectors are unreliable. For most adaptive signal systems that are out there, they require a lot of input. They require a lot of input on what's coming down from the next signal upstream, what's coming on the roadway from the, from the roadway upstream. They require very good detection across, the, across all approaches. And if you lose one of those detectors, those loop detectors that are in the ground, some of them get lost due to moisture seepage down there. If you do any kind of pavement work, a lot of times those detectors will get ripped up. And they, they are, by nature, fairly unreliable, relatively speaking. But if you lose any detector in an adaptive signal system, for the most part, those systems will collapse or you need to recalibrate them. Now, the other big one that comes up is a lot of adaptive signal systems that are out there, previous to the one that I'm going to talk about today, require that you replace your controllers. And those controller cabinets get expensive, especially if that is the, the controller that you have across your entire network. Your signal techs know how to work with a specific controller. You don't necessarily want them to have to have to learn a brand new controller from scratch. There was a deployment in Las Vegas, Nevada, where they actually deployed a SCAT system, and it was incompatible with their existing signal systems. They installed double wide controller boxes. They actually have two controllers side by side. So if the adaptive signal system ever goes wrong, they have to go out there flip a switch and turn on the other controller because none of their signal techs know how to work with the new adaptive signal system. That's just one example of potential incompatibility. Yes? I just uh, want to know, um, in my opinion, mm -hmm. each intersection, the controller by is made separately to meet the demand of that intersection. Like, controller by are not usable uh, for one way for one intersection. Well, you will find the same type of controller cabinet for the most part deployed across an entire agency system, but the, the way the controller is wired and the way it's configured is specific for that intersection. All the stuff that you do in Synchro, for example, or in ACS, whatever you're using to develop your signal timing, those are the adjustments that are specifically made to each controller. Um, in effect, as controllers are getting more and more modern, what you have to do is simply upload that particular configuration to that controller, usually via automated software where you don't actually have to be at the box. You can be at the headquarters at a, at a traffic management center, for example, and basically d upload a new, um, a new timing to that particular box. From box timing? Yeah, you can do that from the outside. Thank you. Yep. And that's a great point. If anybody has any questions or you think I'm saying something that's horribly off, Feel free to shout out. Now this, the following slides come from a paper that was put together by Matt Selinger, who's in the HDR Omaha office. And these, this basically lays out the number of different deployments that he was able to track down in the United States. 38 deployments of adaptive signal systems. You will notice that 25 are still functional. 13 of those have been abandoned. Now he sent this survey out to pretty much every agency he could find that actually manage those systems, had deployed those systems. So the following slides are going to show you what their experience with these systems have been. With SCATs, there are 10 deployments, eight of which are still functional. That's not bad. When you look at Scoot, there were eight deployments in the US, five of which have been abandoned. And a lot of those were detector-based issues or simply the fact that they could not find the time to keep these running. Now, in terms of finding the time, the cost for each of these, and keep in mind this is based on survey returns of how much it actually costs these agencies to deploy these systems. On average, you were looking at $55,000 per intersection. And here's the kicker, the maintenance cost. The cost of actually having somebody maintain and calibrate those systems on a regular basis to keep them up and running. Bear in mind these are coming from survey returns from the actual agencies that deployed these systems. is 8 to 20 hours per week system. Offline time, 
eight hours per week. This has to do with basically <coughs> long-term detector issues, interconnectivity issues. With a lot of the older systems, if you lose interconnectivity between the field and wherever the server is that's actually running the calculations, that system does go offline. Deployment time typically took, according to these agencies that responded, anywhere between two to four months. And what they, what they mean by deployment time is deployment time from the time you first start putting hardware out in the field to the time all the hardware is completed out in the field and the system has become fully calibrated. Because you do have to go out and calibrate each one of these systems once they are deployed for the particular site, for the particular approach. Now, the gist of the problem when it comes to why signals don't operate better than they do has to do, and who, uh, this, since I'm here at PSU, who here was on the traffic bowl team that went out to McMinniman's last uh, November-ish? Anybody? Anybody actually go out there and watch that at the very least? Okay. There was a question in that traffic bowl. What is the thing that has to be maintained in common across a coordinated signal system? And the answer was common cycle lane. Now that's not necessarily true. You do need a common cycle length or your signals in a coordinated system need to be on a multiple of that cycle length. So for the most part that is accurate. And the main reason for that, does anybody know why you need to maintain a common cycle length? Yeah? No, but a good guess. Anybody? Except Ed? Because that simply wouldn't be fair. Well, I will get to the why in a moment. The other item, splits and offsets. You guys are all familiar with that term for those of you who actually do traffic engineering? Splits and offsets, basically, the splits are where you change phases. Your offset is how the offset of the clock. There's a picture of an internal clock in each intersection. Time zero at one intersection is going to be slightly different than time zero at the next intersection. That offset that start of the first green, your coordinated phase. Let's say you're going northbound on 99W. You come to your first intersection, at time zero, that phase turns green. You have to travel a half mile down to the next signal. The offset is designed so that next signal will change on the coordinated phase in time that once you get there, it goes. So the offset is usually a, a, a function of distance, a function of travel speed. Now, where did those concepts come from? Any ideas? This is the actual why. How many of you, and I'm guessing not many of you, because a lot of you in here are college students, have seen this? Anybody? One person. Two people. All right. Do you, for those of you who have not seen this, do you know what this is? This used to be the device that would run all of the signals. This device is somewhere on, Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, about 50, 60 years old? Oh, yeah. The concept for this? Oh, maybe even older than that. I mean, well, that particular one, I'm not sure, but you had that same concept back in the 20s. Exactly. In Chicago, I think. Yeah. So this is very old tech. There are a couple places where I've presented to on this topic where they said they still had a couple of these controllers deployed out in the field. Now, what you see here, the cycle is in that upper corner. You see that little dial that's up in the upper right? On older models than this, you would change your cycle length by actually taking it apart and putting in different sized gears. But that governs the clock, how long it takes for this dial to turn once. The, the time it takes for that dial to turn once is your cycle length. Do you guys see the pins that are in there? Yeah? What do you think those pins are? What? Those are, that, that's, that's when your lights are triggered to change. Those are your splits. Your offset was, so there are a number of ways you coded offset, but effectively the offset was the difference in the timers in the local clock from this intersection to the next intersection to the next intersection. So what you're looking at is a concept, a mechanism for controlling traffic signals that has been around for almost 100 years. And now that we have updated controllers that actually have miniature PCs built into it, do you know what technology we're using now? The same thing. Everything that we have, all the controllers that are built now, have the ability to, make, to emulate this technology. But that's all it's doing. We found a digital way to emulate analog technology. The newer controllers can store hundreds of timing plans. 
But for those of you who don't know, when you switch from one timing plan to another, it takes time for all the, all the signals to come back into coordination. And they call that transition time. And it sometimes takes between 5 and 15 minutes for, tr for transition to be completed across a longer corridor. So even though you have the capability to put in hundreds of signal timing plans, generally speaking, you don't. You have three or four, maybe five per day. Maybe for a special event, you throw in a different timing plan. But the gist of it is, the best of our technology right now emulates this, which has been around for almost a century. Now, in, how does it actually impact the way we drive? This is basically a uh, shown in. Uh, there are ways. To, there are different ways to show signal phasing. Cho chosen in this case to show it linearly. What you see up there is basically a graph of a simple four-legged intersection. And in this case, we don't even. I'm not even showing left turn phases. So what you see here is your four and eight, your two and six, and the time it takes to get from this start to this start is what we call your cycle length. That's basically that dial going around once. Now, if you were to go in, oops, if you were to go in, and let's say that this is running, let's say your two and six, let's say your four and eight is your coordinated phase. If you come in, your coordinated phase is usually held if nobody shows up on the detector for two and six. Two and six being your northbound direction, four and eight being your westbound direction. In my personal example, anyway, if you were to come in here and there's no traffic here on two and six. This 4 and 8 phase holds out, and it continues, unless you have a min gap coded in, or et cetera, et cetera. But if a call comes in, a car pulls up here, and it's too late to serve your minimum green time, you have to wait until that dial goes all the way back around to this point before you can go. A better example would be if you were on a minor street, say a gas station or a tiny little strip mall, and you're trying to turn out onto a main line. You guys have all been in that position, right? Let's say that this is the green time you're hoping for. And usually, because you're turning out of a minor street, a 7-Eleven, or a gas station, this window is only this big. And let's say this is a T intersection of some kind. The main line cycle, if you were to analyze that one tiny little intersection by itself, the cycle length would probably be 40, 50, 60 seconds. It'd be very short. But in this case, because you're trying to coordinate along a longer corridor, the bigger intersections on your corridor are going to make that cycle length very, very long. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? So you're stuck on this tiny little side street. And you miss your window. You come in right about here. On those longer cycle lengths, which are some, in some cases 120, 150, if you go down to California, 210 seconds. If you miss your window, you have to wait until that clock goes all the way back around before it can serve you. Which is why sometimes when you get stuck on that side street, you get stuck for a disproportionate amount of time. You're, you're looking at the main line, and there's nobody home. And you're wondering why you can't just go. That clock, that dial, that's why you can't go. Now, when, you go, when you're looking at analog architecture, you do have to have common cycle lengths. For, for lack of a better way of putting it, you do have a hold on the main street green. That's what makes you sit on that side street, wondering why, if nobody's on the main street, I can't go. It's because you're being held to that common cycle lane, and effectively that holds the main street green. And the other major issue that a lot of uh, very high density, high volume areas have issues with is signal transition. When you're changing from one plan to another, there is going to be a lost time in there. There's going to be a transition time in there, and that time is lost to you. Now, when you go to a digital architecture, all those issues go away. Now the question is, what do I mean by a digital architecture? The InSync system operates with three, I'm going to explain the entire adaptive signal system architecture in about four or five slides. The first thing that they do is they convert analog operations to digital. What does that mean? That means, um, if I had a laser pointer with me, I'd show you, but if I push a button on a laser pointer, when does the light come on? Does it come on immediately? When you flip a switch, well, all right, you want to really parse uh, split hairs. It doesn't come on absolutely immediately. But if you were to flip a switch, the switch is either on or off. The equivalent of putting analog architecture into your light switch would be the equivalent of you hitting the off button and it waiting for that window to come back around before it turns off. 
That's the difference when you're talking about traffic signals in between analog architecture and digital architecture. What they've done is they've boiled this down. What, you've look, what you're looking at here are all the available sequences and states for northbound and southbound movements. Looking at a four-legged intersection, these are all the possible combinations of sequ sequences and states. A state is defined as two non-conflicting phase pairs. And a sequence is very simply the sequence of the states that you can use. This is obviously replicated when you turn it on the side for east and west traffic, but what you're looking at is a total of 16 possible sequences, 16 possible states. Now, in a digital architecture, if me, if I was controlling the cabinet, and I wanted the left turns to go right now, in a digital architecture, I hit a button, all the, the, the lights that need to turn yellow will turn yellow, and my green phase will start as soon as it possibly can. In an analog architecture, if you're stuck on that little side street going onto a main line, you trigger that left turn, you have to wait until that dial comes all the way around to serve your particular movement. So, oh, it looks like I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. Basically, when you boil everything down to sequences and states, the processor in the in-sync controller has to think about three things. What sequence do I pick? What state do I initiate? And how long do I hold that particular state? Now, this all makes sense in a couple slides. Now, there are two other things. There, there's a local optimizer and a global optimizer. The local optimizer operates in a very, very strange way. The first time somebody tried to explain this concept to me, I was confused and then I fell asleep. So, bear with me here. I'm going to try to make it a little less painful. Now, you may wonder, what on earth is the title of this? What, what does that mean, hoarding cookies? Is anybody here familiar with something called the greedy algorithm? Yes? I saw one head nod, a couple. It's basically a fairly commonly known algorithm for optimization uh, that's used in mechanical and, me mechanical and electrical engineering. And effectively, the way it's applied here, it's a slightly modified version of that. But imagine, tell me, there, there we go. Imagine you were assigned to be this guy in the middle of the intersection and I gave you a big basket full of cookies. Okay, sounds strange. Now, imagine I told you there are certain rules you have to abide by. Anytime a car pulls up to the stop bar, you have to give that car a cookie. For every five seconds that car is sitting at the stop bar, you have to give him another cookie. So in that first lane, there are four cars that have pulled up to the stop bar. At time equals zero, you're out four cookies. At time equals five seconds, you're out another four cookies. At time equals five and ten seconds, you're out another four cookies. And you look at every lane on every approach. Your goal is to be as greedy as possible, to change the signals however you want to maximize the number of cookies that you can keep. And that's the gist of the greedy algorithm. What that means is that you have to know exactly how many vehicles are in each lane on each approach at every second. And this is the way that system handles it. What you're seeing here is basically what the in-sync cameras see. You draw out detection zones, which emulate how many cars are actually in each one of those slots. So the camera, or the, the camera is basically the eye. The computer is thinking, is taking the input from the eye, and it knows at every second how many vehicles are on every lane and on every approach, and it's making the decisions on what do I do at this particular intersection to keep the most amount of cookies that I can. Incidentally, for the uh, agency people here, as well as some of the consultants out there, one thing you will notice is the numbers down here. The queue length, which might not always be accurate, it's just an assessment of how, what, uh, how much of that queue is filled, is that top number. The bottom number actually gives you a count of how many vehicles have passed through that intersection. Effectively, you put this system in, it becomes an automated traffic recorder at every single intersection that you deploy at. Yeah? Does that apply to pedestrians at all in any way, if there's a pedestrian there waiting there is, for a while? There is a pedestrian model that is built into this. It's an add-on pack to it. If you did not have the pedestrian model, basically the way the system works, it, it, it is kind of an overlay of any existing controller system. It intercepts all the calls, and I'll get to this in a little bit. Actually, 
tell you what. If I do not answer your question, by the time I get to, um, to how the system actually works with the controller, ask me again. Because by explaining it, I'm actually going to go through a number of different slides a little further up. So sorry about that, but let me defer that. In terms of local optimization, optimization at one intersection, what it looks at, because it's looking at Q, it's looking at Q per lane, and it's looking in the delay of each vehicle at the intersection. It's actually optimizing for volume and delay, but it requires the knowledge of the Q length at every lane on every approach for every second. Now, the global optimizer, this is how it works. Basically, it's just trying to platoon traffic. What you're seeing up here is just imagine that this is the lead car in a massive platoon. It's trying to get those to flow all the way through the corridor as quickly as it can without stop. Excuse me, without stopping. Now, how that works? Is everybody familiar with the time-space diagram? Yeah, this is your time-space diagram. Effectively, you have distance across the bottom, time across the uh, going up the top. Now. What we've drawn out here is a time-space diagram. Imagine this is the time-space diagram for the first platoon coming from each side. Given it's not a band, it's just a line. Now, here comes the second band in each direction. Under normal circumstances, or under traditional signal timing, what is this? This length, this distance right here. It's the time, but it's what, what time is it representing? The headway between two positions, and what do we call that? At this signal, this is the, the time the first vehicle goes to get to the northbound green. This is the time the second vehicle gets to the northbound green. What's the time in between those two? The cycle length. So under a normal circumstances, if you were to draw this diagram for a typical uh, traditional corridor, the distance in between these two lines will always be constant. That's how you hold your common cycle lane. What is different about this is the cycle length does not have to be constant here. You have the ability to make the controller or to make the system use a constant cycle length, but you don't have to. What the system will do is if you allow it to flex the cycle length, it will base the cycle length on the demand on the local optimizer at the critical intersection. So if you have a long corridor of you have one main intersection where it crosses another high volume corridor, that's more often than not your master intersection. And the local optimizer will actually flex the cycle length at that master intersection based on the, the actual demand phase by phase at that intersection. Does that make sense? Now by doing so, what, what happens is we change the way that tunnel looks, the way that line looks, how, how spaced out it is compared to the line before it. Now what this means for your little intersection, let's say that this is that T intersection that you were stuck at coming out of a grocery store or 7-Eleven or whatnot. Normally speaking, in this cycle here, it will serve you once, and only once, because that's the way the analog architecture works. Picture here, though, when that bigger intersection has flexed and has widened that cycle length. In here, if we get a call right here, it can go, and the controller can serve that green. When it's done serving that green, it returns to the main line, and it serves the northbound, gets rid of all the traffic or whatever traffic is in between platoons. Let's say you get another call it goes ahead and it serves that if it can based on the local optimizer. The system gives the capability of actually going back and serving states multiple times in the same cycle. Now here's the other question. If a call comes in here, right about there, the computer has to make a decision. Do I have, let's say the local optimizer says I want to serve that side street. This is where the global optimizer comes in. The global optimizer is telling this controller, I don't care what you do, but when you get to that point, you better be green for northbound. But in between, it's, running it's effectively running free. So at this point, the computer's got to decide, I know I have to be green by the time I get to that line. Do I have the time? Do I have the time to actually serve the minimum green and then switch back 
in time to get the green for northbound. If you do, then it serves it. If you don't, then it doesn't. But what you're seeing here in this one cycle is the fact that this system is able to revert and serve that other phase multiple times, which simply isn't possible in an analog architecture. Oops. Yeah, I'll skip that one. I'm running a little bit long. Um, generally, <coughs> the uh, in-sync adaptive si signal system, the things you need to take out of this, there is no common cycle length. There is no hold on coordinated phases because you don't have a common cycle length. What this means is you have a significant reduction in the amount of side street delay. If you have a super saturated corridor, it will have a benefit to that main corridor, but it's probably not going to be that major. If you have a corridor such as 99W, for example, one where the queues are two or three miles long, it'll give you an extra five, ten percent. But the big deal is going to be what it, its impacts on the side street. It's going to have major impacts on the side street. In fact, on one of the studies, it actually decreased side street delay during the peak hour by about 80%. And it's also going to help your shoulder hours as hours leading to and from the peak. Now, the system, because it's looking at every lane, every queue, every second, is adapting to traffic demand at that moment. With traditional, picture this on a more typical, older version of an adaptive signal system. Picture paying somebody to sit in a room and they get a flow in of traffic data and they put it all into a synchro type system and they hit the optimize button you figure out what your new timings are and you upload those back to the controllers in the field that's effectively how a lot of those systems work so when they're switching from set plans from one plan to another plan to another plan there is lost time there is transition one of the responsive capabilities of, of, of the newer controllers out there some of the newer controllers uh, say that they offer responsive capability. All that is is the ability to flex different phase timings based on what's out there at that moment, but it's given a very, very limited amount of play that it can actually use. So this one is actually truly adaptive to traffic on the spot, and there is no transition. Now, in terms of plug and play, this is where we get into the question of how does it handle pedestrians. The person who originally put this together decided to use a PS3. I'm an Xbox guy myself. <laughs> but the gist of it is, the point of this slide is, if you want 3D gaming, all you have to do is take this. You can plug it into a standard Def TV, a 26-inch that's 10 years old. You can take this same system, plug it into a 60-inch 60, <coughs> 60 plasma. Either way, you, are st you still have the same capabilities. It may not look as pretty, but the capabilities are very much plug and play. You don't have to worry about what controller you have out in the field, and here's why. This is the equipment that gets deployed in the field. You have the eye. The eye talks to the box. This box goes into your detector rack. And what it does is it actually will intercept calls. The eye sees all the cues. It turns around and tells the computer, this is what I got out there. The computer, which is actually a quad-core um, quad PC, will optimize make the decision at the local level, make the decision from the global perspective, and it comes to a decision. I'm going to turn on this phase. When it does that, it, sends, it, it decides, I'm going to turn on this phase, and it, in turn, inputs a detector call. So the actual detectors that are out in the field, the loop detectors, the original hardware that's out there with controller, effectively, we've kind of overridden those inputs. You don't have to remove anything. You don't have to do anything like that. But what this does, you set your controller to run free, which means from the controller's perspective, it, you may have hundreds of vehicles on every single approach. The controller only sees what the in-sync box wants it to see. So the controller will only see a call for the northbound through and the northbound left. It will not see any of the other traffic because it, the, uh, the Travis system, the in-sync box, has intercepted all of those calls. So as long as a controller is capable of using a detector, loop detectors, video detectors, what have you, which means pretty much every controller that's out there right now, as long as the controller is capable of, um, of taking data in from a detector, it's compatible with this system. Yeah? I just have a question about the, the um, conflict between the loop detectors mm -hmm. and this 
camera? There is no conflict because the, the loop detectors will not, the, the, they basically become unplugged from the controller. The, the controller doesn't see anything that the InSync doesn't, box doesn't want it to see. That but you were, uh, if, you know, putting a little emphasis on that we lose the, uh, the loop detectors while resurfacing the streets or get damaged. Yeah. So how that related to this, I mean, why we care that much when, when we are using the InSync adaptive uh, oh. system? Okay, what you're referring to are the other adaptive signal systems, the ones that actually involve lots of loops on the ground. They have issues with the reliability of those loops. With this system, it's not susceptible to that because it uses video detection. Video detection may not be as accurate as loop detection, <coughs> but it's proven to be uh, more reliable in terms of how long a camera is usable for, depending on the model that you put out there. So what I was referring to about detector reliability earlier was, specific <coughs> was specifically related to the older models that actually rely on loop detection. Okay. Now, as this is a plug-in for existing architecture, all the calls are passive. What InSync does is it looks at the vehicle detection. Now, what this means is it does not override your preemption. It does not override your existing central system software, transit signal priority, or your pedestrian calls. The way it handles pedestrian calls is very simply that the controller still has the control over to the pedestrians. And the controller is only seeing very minimal traffic or whatever the InSync box chooses to show it. What this means is, if you are expecting a high volume of pedestrians, the pedestrians are just being allowed to basically walk when they want to walk. If you're expecting more than five ped calls per hour, there's an additional module that needs to be added into this system. And that module accounts for the actual pedestrian delay and factors that in as well. Otherwise, it will probably allow the pedestrians to go more often than they probably should for the benefit of vehicular traffic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Told you I'd get to your answer. <coughs> I'm going to die here. Okay. Anyway, the next slide here is a little bit of marketing, but um, I left it in here because it's got good stats. The key here is, in the deployments that have gone out in the field, it has, sh it has been shown to reduce arterial delay and stops between 20 and 60 percent. As far as the rest of it's concerned, it's very easy to install, configure, but since you guys... Uh, obviously don't care about that right now, not a big deal. Um, here is a summary results from one particular study. This is Missouri Route 291, and it goes from a freeway, and up there what you don't see is it turns into a freeway. So this is one tiny little segment of signalized arterial in between two freeway segments. And there are 12 signals on this arterial, and they are arranged in such a way that under traditional means there is no way to coordinate both directions at the same time and they've tried for over a decade to coordinate both directions at the same time. They decided after a while, they just gave up, worked on one, got that one direction to work very, very well, and that's what they left it at until they put the in-sync system in. Now what you're seeing here is the delay time before and after. What I want you to note in particular, as you can tell here in the before hours, they optimized the northbound direction, and they tried to optimize that as much as they possibly could. So what you're seeing here in terms of the percent difference of how much longer it took to get from one point to the other, not that big an effect on the northbound direction. You have a pretty substantial impact on the southbound direction because that's the direction that wasn't optimized. If you look at the after times, you're looking at the around 250 seconds and you're looking at around 250 seconds. So once this system was implemented, because it could flex the cycle length, it made it possible to actually interconnect platoons going in both directions, which wasn't possible using analog architecture. In terms of stops, yes, it did make stops go up in one instance, but you're talking about 0 0.8 to 0 uh, 0.6 to 0 0.8. So with those small numbers, you have a very large percentage, at least from the look of it. But what you want to see is this one over here, the direction that they were not able to coordinate in the past. Now they actually can um, interconnect in both directions, and they're able to optimize for both directions thanks to being able to flex that cycle length. You're looking at a reduction in stops anywhere up to 
and there is a marketing video that I believe Ed has seen a number of times where they did go out and interview these people who have driven down this corridor and she's talking about how she felt God was with her those days and et cetera, et cetera. But I'll spare you the, the big time marketing push there. It was kind of cool to see the kind of reactions that you did get from people who are actually just normal people out in the field. But anyway, in terms of delay, here are the results that they got for that. Again, not as pronounced in the, uh, in the northbound direction as they are in the south. Notice that in the northbound direction, it did actually get slightly worse in the morning. But again, that was because they were optimizing for the peak hour so very heavily, but only in one direction. At the same time, if you look at the other direction, you're noticing a massive difference. And again, this is only mainline. The cross street volumes, one of the cross streets is the output of a high school, which has a substantial peak hour meaning all the traffic comes out. I mean, nobody wants to stick around class when they're done. When uh, your instructor comes up here and sa says, you're done, 90% of you are out that door in the first 90 seconds. Same thing happens in high school. And obviously, we can't really time for that that well. Now, that high school exit is right next door to a pair of ramp terminal interchanges. That is a signal timer's nightmare. That used to actually queue back onto the freeway. All those queues are now gone. The, the massive delays you used to see coming out of the high school, those are all gone. Those cycle failures are all gone. Again, this is some uh, marketing stuff that I forgot to take out. But because I did happen to mention cost, I will leave this slide in there and actually talk about this. The cost per intersection is significantly decreased. But the key thing is the setup time is very, very minimal. Once the system is actually deployed in the field, the cameras are turned on, the system begins to learn by itself. Now, the system also keeps 30 days of data inside its own brain, which means if you lose a camera, the system will actually try to emulate based on what happened last Tuesday, the Tuesday before. It looks at all those increments, the 15-minute incre increments, from, the, from its historical memory and actually tries to fill in the gaps. In one instance, and I believe this is in Georgia, they lost a camera on one approach and nobody noticed for 30 days. On the 31st day, because that computer ran out of its historical data, that was the day they started noticing problems. Went out there in the field and realized that camera had been hit by something or another, had been knocked out for quite some time, and nobody noticed. Now, other benefits. This is an interesting story. They used to have a red light running camera on Missouri Route 291. After the deployment of this system, the chief of police called up the MoDOT engineer and said, we are going to take that camera out and move it somewhere else. And the MoDOT engineer asked why. And the answer he got was, well, now that the system is in, there's nobody left when the light turns red to run the red. So that was one very interesting uh, piece of information. In terms of overall accident rate, just due to the fact that there were no cues left when the light turned red, you lost a lot of rear end collisions so much so that the accident rate actually decreased by about 38%. And again, this is without doing anything more than adjusting signal timing. Now, the other implications. Here, here's the part where I'm going to move into a little bit of academics. If we go to digital signal controllers, forget about the adaptive signal system implementation. We are long overdue in terms of getting rid of trying to emulate this concept. But Everything that we do revolves around cycle lengths, splits, and offsets. So when it came time to try to model an in-sync system or just a digital controller, we found that there is no methodology out there right now, and there is no software out there right now that has the capability of doing this. So if they make that simple switch from an analog concept to a digital concept, and they do away with cycle splits and offsets, HCS goes away, Synchro goes away, Corson goes away, Vison goes away. Everything that we use right now in terms of our day-to-day -day tools will need to be overhauled one way or another. Now, we did get asked the question, how on earth do you model this? Because at the time I started talking about this, there was only one field deployment. And a lot of agencies were like, show us the numbers. Show us the numbers. Just you telling us what, what the benefits are, it sounds like it's too good to be true. So we had to figure out a way to model it. And the key was, the system collects queue length information for every lane, for every approach. We chose to use VISM. How many people here are actually familiar with VISM? A couple of you, but actually a surprising number of you. The detectors in there are only loop detectors. We had to find a way to fake Q-length information into VISM. 
So what we did was we figured out if we actually coded in detectors back to back to back to back, each one roughly the size of a car, if you know that in VISM it's these detectors, the ones that are actually named after the phases that actually cause the signal to do something. Yeah? I mean, if you want to, uh, want to call phase 5, you have to put an input call on detector 5 if you're letting the controller run free. What we've done here is we've coded out all the different detectors. So we know, for example, if detector 213 is lit up and 214 is not, that for phase 2, lane 1, there are three cars in that queue. If, four, if 535 is lit and 536 isn't, we know for phase 5, lane 3, there are five cars in that queue, not six. So we were able to emulate what the, the, what the eye, what the video detection camera was actually looking for and looking at. And by doing that, we had to send it out of the comm interface and over to an actual box, an actual in-sync box. And in order to do that, we actually had to develop a completely separate set of software. And we actually, we did work, uh, rhythm engineering, HDR, and PTV all worked on that interface. Effectively, what that little interface does is it collects the data from these loops, changes into queue length data, and then transfers it over to an in-sync box. We had a PC that was actually emulating the, uh, emulating the in-sync controller. The software was loaded onto that. And for every PC, we did run a virtual machine inside that PC. So effectively, for every traffic signal we had, for every, sorry, for every PC we had, that PC could emulate two traffic signals. So when we went ahead and modeled a 20-signal corridor, we actually had to, have 20, uh, we had to have 10 PCs emulating the in-sync boxes because they were running that kind of, comp uh, that kind of intensive algorithm. Did I lose anybody on that? Cool. Now, the other downside is simulations have to be done in real time because we weren't able to actually speed up in sync's calculations. Hope we're working on that one right now. But for those of you who have done simulation for real projects, at an absolute minimum, you need how many runs before you feel comfortable averaging them all together? Five, ten, in some cases, 20, 30. At an absolute minimum, you're usually looking at 10 if not 15. And usually you're not only looking at the peak hour, you're looking at the seating time, you're looking at the hour before, the hour during, the hour after. Imagine having to run 10 runs of three hours worth of simulation time. This is the kind of thing you start it before you leave for the weekend, you let it run over the weekend, you come back and hope you don't throw an error. So there are some problems with that right now, but that's just to highlight that going forward, you go to a digital architecture, we lose all the tools that we currently have for analysis purposes. Now, going forward, what this means is you are probably going to you are probably going to see in the very near future controllers going to a digital architecture. And that's my boss, and I'm ignoring. Him, so, what we're have to, we're going what we're also going to have to see is development of a new methodology. There's going to there has to be something that needs to be developed to fill in these gaps. What happens? What happens to a signal when you're trying to analyze it? Even with something as simple as HCM, all that goes away because all of our analysis tools right now are based on cycles, splits, and offsets. There's nothing else out there that we use right now. Now, what we found for the analyses that we've run so far is we did have to analyze them in real time, and they, off, they were very, very complex. We had no capability to just take a set of turning movement counts, look out there in the field, plug it in the HCM, and at least get a ballpark idea of how that signal would operate. That ability to get that fatal flaw look, that ability to get that ballpark idea, it's now gone if you go to a digital architecture. So as simple as that change may mean, going away from emulating that 100-year-old methodology. And bear in mind, when that tech was invented, we were in the Great Depression. Actually, no, we were in World War I. We are still using those concepts right now. And just the thought that if we go away from that concept, it scraps all the analysis that we have capability to do right now kind of scary. So, anyway, at this point I'd like, wow, those videos did not turn out. Yeah, that's actually me. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I was on vibrate. I guess I wasn't. 
So, obviously you're not going to see anything from this video. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can pull <coughs> that up and just overlay it while I okay, open it up we have questions. Um, yeah, we don't have too much time for questions now. Um, we have about four minutes at most. So, <coughs> go ahead and take a couple questions, please. And for those of you in the class, if you don't have to, make sure you write down your questions and hand them in to me if you don't get to ask them directly. Yes. Oh, for the, could you tell me about the, the Vancouver, Washington example, why that, why that failed and what, you know, how you could make something like that uh, Apparently succeed? that had to do with privacy issues having to do with the video detection, the fact that it took very, very long to calibrate it, the fact that on day one, when they advertised the fact that it was going to turn on, it wasn't fully calibrated and it caused an absolute gridlock nightmare of a disaster. So um, they started off on the wrong foot. Uh, they didn't enjoy, they didn't provide enough PI up front, and um, it was basically a public relations nightmare to the point where they're probably going to be very hesitant to do one again in the near future. Either I explain things really well or I bored you all to tears. Um, well, we have a few people watching on the on the web. Okay. Why don't I ask one of their questions? Um, this viewer asks, since this design is more effective for side streets rather than fully saturated intersections, at least that's his presumption, mm -hmm. um, and usually when it comes to improving intersections, money is allocated first to busy intersections, how do you expect to have funding to implement this design? Now, uh, perhaps that's a miss, uh, perhaps that's a s I didn't clarify that. When I said that it wasn't as effective for, su for saturated, I meant super saturated to the point where there is zero excess capacity that you're really going to be able to squeeze out of it. There are very few locations in the state of Oregon, or for that matter in Lower Washington, that satisfy that criteria, with the possible exception of 99W. Um, can you repeat the second half of that question? Um, yeah, the second half, okay. How do you Since money is typically money? allocated to the very busy intersections, I guess, how, how would you fund Okay. On this. Uh, that w almost would be a better question for Ed, who's in the back of the room, because he has all his strings. But the gist of it is that um, I, d I don't think there is a single intersection that I can think of in Oregon or Washington that falls under the super saturated conditions that I was talking about. When I say super saturated, I'm talking VC over 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 1.7. We're talking about corridors that are so overloaded. Say, for example, you're, the demand is 3,600 vehicles per hour in a single direction on three lanes. We're talking well beyond any possibility of uh, capacity. But uh, when it comes to something like that, uh, you, you'd be hard pressed to find funding. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any numbers in terms of the impact of these systems on? transit signal priority? Does it make it better, the same, or worse? Nobody and has tried that yet. Okay. There are ab about a thousand signals now that have been deployed across the United States, mostly spread out in the American Southeast and the Midwest. But let me tell you how transit signal priority works. With this system, if you just have transit in the lanes, you don't have a dedicated bypass lane, the way it works is very simple. You can tell the emulator, the local optimizer, that if you see a bus, that bus is equal to 50 cars or 50 cookies. So the moment you see that bus come in, it's going to place so much emphasis on serving that that it will go just mm -hmm. like that. And you can change the number of uh, cookies that it's assigning to those higher priority vehicles. You can make it equal to 10 cars or equal to 50 cars. If you make it equal to 1,000 cars, for example, that bus will always get there and very rarely ever have to stop. So the, the global up optimization tool is going to look at the different signal priorities along the corridor and try to manage that or it's just going to be done in a case by case basis it will be done at the local level the global optimizer is only looking at platooning those vehicles through but if the local optimizer at the master intersection sees that transit come in and it starts the tunnel sooner it what it's doing is it's flexing that cycle length and that tunnel will progress all the way through uh, and if everything works out right, ideally that transit unit will not have to stop again. But basically what you're doing, if you place a higher, high enough priority on that transit unit, 
when it comes in, it will be part of that core platoon that everybody, that everything else will time itself off of. Okay. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up now. Sorry about that. Just before we thank our, our guest speaker, I just want to put in a plug for next week's seminar. Next week, um, the topic is Overcoming Barriers to Bicycling in Low-Income and Minority Communities, and it's being presented by Lynn Weigand of IBPI and Allison Graves, Executive Director of Community Cycling Center. So for today, let's thank um, um, Smith for his presentation. <laughs>